Hebrews, the 10th chapter. I want to say first thank you to um, all of you that are, have been so faithful for so long. You know, and not just to come into the little country church, but you've been faithful in God for so long. Last week for me was 43 years that I've been serving God. And that's a, that's a long time, you know, but for some, you, you know, maybe just getting started. But there's something about pressing on and going on and staying faithful. So this week, I reminded myself that there are times that it's not so much that uh, a season falls and I need to teach or preach on that, or, but to look at it and say, God, I feel like sometimes I'm like a doctor that looks over the congregation and the, the culture that we're in and say, Lord, what is it that we really need to hear right now? And I think about the, the people that Paul spoke to in the book of Hebrews, uh, chapter 10. Are you comfortable? Hebrews chapter 10. We'll be starting in verse 32. But before we do, let me just ask you this question. Have you ever gotten so exhausted from waiting for God's promise to come to pass something that you believed for and it hasn't happened yet, perhaps the salvation of family members, me mentioning my grandkids, um, things that would turn around in life, and you and you just tempted to say, forget it. I've waited long enough. I'm not going to sit here. I ain't going to wait any longer. I've given enough of my life to this, and I'm tired of it. I'm going to toss the whole thing away and move on with my life. Uh, some years back, I was out deer hunting, and uh, I got to a place where I, I'd been going out in the mornings and the afternoons and the mornings and afternoons, and I said, I, I'm really, I'm fed up with it. I'm tired of it. Ain't nothing happening. I remember uh, during that time, I even brought my pastor, Mike Van Britson, out with me hunting, and we, we sat there all morning for a couple of hours, and then I heard a, a tapping noise and realized that he had gotten so bored that he was slapping on the side of the the uh, deer stand, and I looked at him with this disdain that I'd been there for hours, and if anything does come out, it ain't now. And, uh, he, and he looked at me and literally said, well, you got a problem with that? And I said, yeah, I do. Uh, I ain't tagging you ever with me again. Uh, and then there was a, uh, then right at the end of deer season, I, I just about fed up and, and I was out at the ranch, you know, we have a limited amount of venison running around. And, uh, so I, I was fixing to get out of the stand. I was literally getting up from my seat in an eight point walked out and I thought, God, you are so good. Amen. And, uh, that thing was well taken care of after that. Uh, but I thought it was just, it was just at the right time. And I think many times we give up too quick, and we, we don't wait long enough, and there's a reward coming. As I walk through this scripture, I think about what would Thanksgiving and Christmas be like to these people. You know, they didn't have the celebrations like we do and, and re be reminded to celebrate. But here's Paul mentioning in verse 32, remember those earlier days after you had received the light? When you stood your ground in a great contest in the face of suffering? Let me back up to you the day that you got light. God took you out of darkness and brought you into light. The Bible says into his dear son. There's something about getting born again. There's something about that day when you said yes to Jesus and it changed you. I, and I'll tell you, I, I always remember, it's November the 10th, 1979. I received the light. I mean, it was like a light bulb went on, excitement hit me, and, and I realized that God loved me, and, and I actually was going to heaven, and I didn't know what waited for me, but now after 43 years, I can tell you, it's been a great run. It's been so exciting. It hadn't been boring. I don't know where y'all come up with, but people come up with churches boring. It's never been boring to me. I've always, I'm always going to get something out of it. There's going to be some fellowship. There's going to be some connection. I received some light, but then I walk on, and it says here, that after you got the light, you stood your ground in the great contest in the face of suffering. I've never been through a lot of suffering. I've been made poked fun of, laughed at in the plant where I used to work many years ago. Um, I, I've won people to Christ. You know, I've, I've had a little jail time in my life, and, and I've, I've had some situations where this looks like it could be a little persecution, but nothing like what these people went through. Nothing like what these guys handled. And it says sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult 
and persecution. At other times, you stood by side by side with those who were so treated. In other words, you weren't, but your friends were. You sympathized with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. I, I'm reading this, and I'm saying to myself, I, I've had stuff stolen, and I've got upset over it. And God help me, I'd have probably shot somebody in the leg. I, did, I didn't take it real joyfully. Hello? I'm going to be honest, saints. We don't. We don't. We get upset about it. But these people, they had no choice. It was the government taking their stuff from them. Now, as much as I, I disapprove of a lot of our government, they hadn't really came and started taking all my stuff away yet. So they took their stuff away. They removed it. And I know some of you have gone through a little bit of this. But, but in the Bible, when he walks through this, it says to them, look, you knew that yourself, you had a lasting possession. So I got to remind myself there's something waiting for us. There's something on the other side. And what we do here is going to matter there. Then he just keeps on going. And Paul brings it out a little bit further when he says in verse 35, so don't throw away your confidence. It will be richly. Come on, say that word. Amen. You need to persevere. That's the word hupomene. Amen. The ability to endure. You need to persevere. So when you've done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. Our problem, we get hung up on a little while. We get hung up on a little while because we think little while means uh, the way we think little while. And some of you realize waiting on a woman is just a little while. Huh? Amen. It's just a little while. But, but Christ coming back has something to do with the mercy of the next generation. If he came back in your generation, amen, what about the ones that are coming up next? He wants to take as many as he can. Can you get an amen? Amen. So with that little while, we get hung up on that little word right there. So he who is coming will come and we will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. He's quoting out of Habakkuk here. And if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. I'm going to say that again. We're not of those who shrink back we are, and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. Now, I could preach this morning and have thought on, don't get to shrinks. Yes, anybody get to shrinks? Amen. You get talking about Jesus around and they shrink up. Uh, a little persecution hits you, you shrink up. A little trouble comes and you shrink up. But, but there's another third, uh, word I'm thinking about is sulks. You ever seen anybody sulk? It's got to be a country word, sulking. Amen. It's where the lip sticks out and that sadness comes. You're looking good, Parker. That's pretty much a real close sulk right there. Amen. But, but there's something about when you just, <laughs> he, he, he looked at me like, that's what I mean. When you just kind of feel like you're sad and you're upset and that things are not going to go the way you want it to. Amen. We've all been there. Father, I thank you for the word. I ask you to take my lips and anoint them and let them share this word with the hearts of the people. I thank you for the faithfulness in this house. In Jesus' name, everybody say it. Amen. Come on, give me a big amen. amen. I, I love this, this passage. I, you could preach so many places here, amen, out of this. But there's something about this word, don't throw away your confidence. Confidence is a plant of slow growth. It takes a little while to be confident in the things that you're doing. You know this, if you're good at something, it didn't happen overnight. It took a while for you to get good at it. If you're, if you're a roper, it takes a little while to, to be good at it. If you, if you shoot guns, it takes a little while to get good at it. Amen. You've got to keep practicing and working on it. If you're cooking, you just don't hit that first cake and say that was thing. That was, you got to stay on it, right, Miss Linda? You got to stay working on it. confidence. Is keeping your chin up. Overconfidence is sticking your neck out. So you got to learn the difference there. The power of confidence. When once a saint puts his confidence in the salvation of God, once you realize you are really saved. I think that's a slide right there, sis, for folk to catch, or whoever's running me back there in the back. I can't see. Go, go to the next slide. Nah, yeah, I thought I had it there. Well, when once the saint puts his confidence in the salvation of God, no tribulation or affliction can ever touch that confidence. When we realize that there is no hope of deliverance in human wisdom, the more I hear about humans thinking they're smart, the more I realize there's no hope in that. Or in the human opinion, what a human thinks, or in anything that we can do. You know, it's the finest cure confidence is for this generation, amen, or spiritual sulks. Confidence, see, you can't have confidence and condemnation at the same time. You know what condemnation is when you tell yourself you're bad? When you tell yourself you're no good? 
When you start listening to something right up here on your shoulder that tells you you're never going to make it, that condemnation that condemns you for what you've done in your past, 1 John 3 says, for if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. There are times your heart's going to tell you you ain't going to make it. Uh, I've, I've seen this written before, and it's, uh, it's ludicrous. Let your heart lead you. Do what, do what your heart make, makes you happy. Did you know your heart is deceitfully wicked? That inside of you that there's trouble? That the enemy is in you, amen. And so if you, if you listen to your heart, you're in trouble. Your heart has a lot to do with your emotions. So you have to be able to shed your emotions. I, it, ain't, it doesn't matter if I don't feel saved, I'm saved, amen. God loves me. He cares for me. So I've got to shake that off and move forward and have confidence in that. You've you got to break the power of the heart there, amen. You've got to look. That's why the Bible says guard your heart with all diligence. Watch after your heart, because your heart will get you in a whole lot of trouble. The heart will get you connected with people you shouldn't be connected with. Amen. So guard your heart. Romans 8, 1, there is therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Condemnation says, I'm going to the gallows. Condemnation says, death is waiting for me. Condemnation says, I'm going to hell. It, there's no condemnation. You're not being condemned by those that are in Christ Jesus. It goes on in Romans 8, 33, says, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns Christ Jesus? Jesus, we, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, and is also interceding for us. When I, you know, and again, it's not to try to justify your sin or your failures, but it's to remind you that the blood is so powerful. His voice is so powerful in your life that when God talks to you and, and speaks over you, and, and literally the Scripture says sings over you, amen, I understand that he's interceding for me. So first, Jesus died for me. You've got to take that personal. He died for me. Amen. He loves me like that. The next part of this verse says he's alive and is seated at the right hand of God. He didn't stay dead. Amen. He rose from the dead. That's the power of the resurrection. And when he rose, he rose with a purpose to sit at the right hand of God and intercede for you. So he's also praying for you that you make it. So don't give up on your faith. Don't condemn yourself. Have confidence in God. Don't throw away your confidence. You've been serving God this long. Don't give up on God. That's what he's saying here. Amen. Stay with it. So when you have confidence in God, amen, in the face of intimidation, verse 35, cast not away your confidence, which has a great recompense of rewards. The words cast not away are taken from a Greek word, which is a compound of words, apo and bala. Amen. The, the word literally means away. It means to throw something such as a ball, a rock, or some object. When these two words are compounded together, it means to throw away, to discard, or to get rid of something no longer desired, needed, or wanted. When you throw away your confidence, you're going to live in condemnation the rest of your life. You'll backslide and walk away from God. You're going to, live in you're going to remember the good things of God. Amen. Your confidence won't be there. You know, it, it's funny when I see confidence rise up. It ain't the size of the man or the woman. It's the confidence in the man and the woman. And when you've got confidence in your walk with God, you know, look, if God pulled me through this once, if God pulled my kids through this once, I believe he'll do it again. So confidence is all outspokenness. It's, it's being frank. It's being full of assurance. Again, it's not being cocky. It's confidence. It is attached to your confession. It's how you talk. I can listen to people talk and tell you if they're confident or not. Amen. All you got to do is listen that they're confident in their walk with God, their love for God, they're going to heaven. Uh, when I see folks say, uh, well, I hope so. Well, <laughs> I hope so too. But are you confident? When I, go, I don't go to bed at night scared anymore. I don't go to sleep going, man, I hope, if, I pray to God if, if I die, that, Lord, you're going to take me. I know he'll take me. Amen. If something happens to me, an accident, I know God's got me. And I want to pastor people of confidence. People that know, when I can stand over you and go, you know what? I know that brother. I know that sister. They had confidence in God. Amen. They served God. They loved their children, their, their spouse. They took care of them. There was something about they loved the house of God. Amen. I'm confident in this. Again, Romans 10, 33. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insults persecution. Other times you stood by with those who were so treated. You sympathize with those that are in prison. Again, we don't know a lot of people that are in prison for righteousness. But this time people were. 
They were thrown in jail all the time for preaching the gospel, for loving Jesus. And, and maybe, maybe that day will come into our life. And it does. I pray you remember this word. Amen. Just to keep your confidence. Amen. You had your stuff confiscated. These saints lived with threats. The purpose of a threat is an expression or an intention to inflict evil or damage. A threat is a menace, one that represents a threat. The purpose of a threat is to cause fear in your life, to feel threatened. Lift your hand if you locked your doors last night. I'm just seeing who I could break into. We lock our doors. I got dogs in my house. Amen. One is going to warn you, the other one ain't going to say a word. He does eat you alive. Amen. I, that my, you know, we, we have this security thing. We take, we, what we want to do is live a life where we take threats away. Can I get an amen? Because threats do bring fear. They bring fear into your life. And these people here were threatened all the time. You know, fear and faith have something in common. Listen to me. Fear and your faith have something in common. Both believe that what you cannot see will happen. Fear tells you what you can't see is going to happen. Faith says what I cannot see is going to happen. Amen. I can't see that I'm going to heaven, but I know it's going to happen. I'm believing God for healing. I can't see it right now, but I know it's going to happen. Amen. That's what that, so they have those two things in common. You can't be afraid of a day you've never seen. Your fear will hold you back from flexing your faith in God. Our worst imaginations almost never happen, and almost all our worries die in vain anticipation. It's amazing how we worry and worry and worry, and it never happens. You almost mad because what you worried about didn't happen. Amen. You upset because you spent all that energy worrying. It. And you worried and you worried and you called people and you worried and you worried. You didn't pray about it, you just worried about it. Amen. When it didn't happen, you got ticked off. You're upset now. Amen. So threats, threats bring, uh, fear brings threats. Threats lock you out of your future. Tells you you don't have a future. Threats confine you from expanding your life. Threats intimidate you out of your purpose. Threats will keep you from God's connections in your life. You, because of a threat, you won't make friends no more. You won't re reconnect with old friends. Threats will limit you and keep you from taking a risk. Threats will shut you out of the promises of God. You know, I, the things I've got to do in life have been amazing. I may never get to jump out of a plane again, but I did it once. And that, there was that... That moment of going up in that plane that I thought to myself, Kenny, I can't turn back now. I got to do this. But there was that threat, that fear that tried to hold you back from that, that moment you're going to get. Uh, whether it be zip line or snowmobile. I talked to my grandson, like I said the other day, and he said, Papa, I hate the cold. You know, down here we don't imagine that. He said, I hate snow. I said, what about snowmobiling? I love snowmobiling. Well, I might hate one thing, but I can like snowmobiling in it. Amen. And, and, and threats keep you back in life. You, you don't hunt no more. You don't go out no more. You don't, you don't, you, you don't, you know, you, there's certain things that hold you. You can't allow threats to do that. You can't let fear on you. Threats will cause you to develop a siege mentality, mentality, overly fearful attitude. There's one thing we got to fight against is fear in our lives. Amen. So here, Paul said, listen, guys, I know that, that they want to, they confiscated your stuff. You've been with folk that are in prison. Amen. You've been threatened. you suffered. But don't throw away your confidence. Amen. Your faith in God. Do you walk with him all these years? Don't throw that thing away right now. The reservoir of confidence. Remember how you made it through? Look back and remember. Call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, after you got the light, you endured a great fight of afflictions. Call to remember. Remind yourself. Bring to your mind. You know what I do? I go back and I remember you. The people in this house, my friends, my brothers and sisters that stood with me, amen, and they said, you know what, don't throw it away, don't give up. We've all had those times where our heads are down, we're sad about something, maybe it didn't work out the way we thought it was, and because of that, we just want to throw it away. Have people in your life that when that happens, they're going to give you a call. They're going to look after you. Hey, listen, it ain't always the preacher that's going to be able to do that for you. You're going to have to connect with people around you that when you're struggling, and that's why I say we got to call people. We got to connect with people. We got to text them. However it is you get hold of them, you got to get hold of them and remind them, hey, man, don't throw away your confidence. Don't give up on God now. Don't you do it. I can't tell you how many times I've made that call to my friends, and it's because they made that call to me. 
Amen. They looked after me. They pulled me in like that. So he said, call to remembrance, and then get back into your faith life. Get back in to believe in God for things. You endured a, a great fight of afflictions. You held up. You remained with fortitude. The afflictions are emotional hardships and pain. And I would love to tell the American church that you have not gone through nothing yet. You've not. Our problem is apathy. Apathy. Amen. We, we just, <laughs> ain't nothing happening. So if ain't nothing happening, we're just going to step out of it. There are days, uh, I could ask you this crazy question. What would you eat this week? And I ask you what you eat this week. Very few of you can pull up how many meals you had and what you had. Amen. But you made it to Sunday. Your health got you here. And they sometimes in church, you may not remember what was preached, but the Word of God went into your life and built your faith. Amen. And you began to keep your confidence alive. Amen. So you've got to stay with it. He says here, e e affliction, even though you were the gazing stock, exposed for public show, you were a spectacle. After this week, and because I heard you mention something about politics when you were praying about this, the thing that took place, and I know many conservatives were praying for a red wave and a big change, we are in a place right now of a post-Christian society. Uh, when I realized, I said, God, I believe in women's rights, but I also believe in the rights of the unborn. I, I believe that, that you created male and female, and you blessed them that way. I don't understand this gender thing that's going on. This inclusion thing that's taking place, not in just America, but in the world, that says that all religions are the same. Just pick you a God and serve that God. Uh, this, this, and we're all going to be, and don't pick on anybody else's God or say anything about them, because if you do, you know, it, it's, it, you're going to start trouble. I said, God, I don't understand the day I'm in right now. It doesn't remind me when I got saved in the 70s and when I served God in the 80s and the 90s, amen, when there was a difference between righteous and unrighteous. When people started doing it, you could tell in the, the church, but all of a sudden the church started looking worldly and the world started looking churchy, amen, and it, where's the defining line? God, I want you again. So God reminded me, Jerry, you just served me. You serve me with all your heart, your soul, and your spirit, amen, everything you've got, and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to work everything out. I, I've, I've often had this escape mentality. I'll be dead before the real trouble comes. Anybody ever thought like that? Amen. I, I'll, I'll be out of here for all the real. But if I don't want to leave a mess to my grandkids. Amen. So I want them to know God. And when I look at this gazing stock, how people look at us and say, you, you, you're crazy for thinking that way. You, you know, knowing yourself that you've got a heaven, a better and enduring substance. How will we endure if even making it to church is a hardship? It was too cold this morning, Pastor, to come to church here in South Texas. When we feel no need to pray until rough times come. We don't talk to God until bad times come. Until, until we got to go in the hospital and have surgery. Or, or until we hear about a friend doing this. The only time we pray is when there's trouble. Amen. When do you just talk to God? How, is that, yeah, look, all them hours you spend deer hunting and you ain't talking to God, I'm talking to God all the time. You fishing, amen, I, 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 you got to be talking to God. You cooking, you need to be talking to God. You driving, you need to be talking to God. Amen. Every opportunity you get, you need to talk to him. Amen. And then listen. Listen to him. Hear what he says to you. You know, how is it that w when tithing is difficult and your goods are having, uh, having even been confiscated, amen, you're struggling even giving a tithe, but all your stuff ain't even been stolen, these people were given to God. So Paul said to him, don't cast away your confidence. He said it for a reason. The word was why. Why do we hold on to our confidence? Don't cast away because there's a reward connected to it. First John, hey, listen, we can't even imagine the reward. The reward you get. As a young man, I, I, would, I would work in the fields, and I literally in the fields, picking cotton, and I'd get a reward. I'd get some money. I could take that money and exchange it for an uh, orange juice or a Snickers bar. I could get something for that. As, I'm talking about being six, seven-year-old, going and picking, uh, working for a peddler from the time I was 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, hoeing, and I'd get that little bit of money. I went up to the store, Miss Ruby, store Miss Ruby, look at me. She said, you got credit. I got what? You got credit here. You know, when you 10, 11, 12 years old, you already got credit. 
Why you got credit? Because I'm working for her husband. Her husband is a, is a vegetable peddler. So I'm working and I'm picking beans and peas and, and hoeing strawberries. Amen. And shucking corn. And I got credit at the store. I walk in and say, Miss Ruby, how much credit I got? She said, $5.50. So I'm going to go get me a Snickers bar and an orange juice. I remember. Those are my two favorite things. I take it back. It was a Milky Way. Amen. Back in that day, they had a Mars bar, too, I got into. But I always went to orange juice. I had credit in that store. She'd minus that. But I got a reward for my work and what I did. And God said, if I stay faithful to him, and if I don't cast away my confidence, I get a reward. I got, you got credit in heaven. I don't know what it's going to be like. I really don't. If we did, we wouldn't be here now. We'd already exited this place. But God says, listen, I got a real, if you don't cast it away, if you stick with me, if you stay with me, if you keep your confidence alive, you got a reward in heaven. 1 John 5, 14. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Hebrews 11, verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Faith and confidence are almost cousins. They're first cousins. I mean, they're just alike. We have confidence in God, have faith in God, to believe God, and that's all you need is faith in God. And when you got faith in him, your salvation is sure, your healing is coming. I'm telling you, he's a rewarder. It means to give for services rendered. I don't know why, but he does. He said, listen, I'm just a daddy up here. I love you like this. My son died for you. And if you stay faithful, I'm going to reward you, not just in this life, but in the life that's coming. Being confident of this, verse, uh, Philippians 4, 1, 6, being confident of this, here's confidence of this very thing, that he which began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He's performing something in you. He's pulling for you, amen, to give you a reward. I, 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 my mind is blown. My mind is blown. First, I'm, I'm just going to give you eternal life. Everybody wants to live. Second, everybody would like to live forever. Third, I'm going to give you a reward for living forever. Why are you so good to me? Why you love me like that? No one's ever loved me like that. The more you understand your Bible, the more you realize how much God loves you. That's why every church in America should be packed. Amen. Knowing that what we do here is going to matter there. And for us to keep our confidence alive, since I look at you, I see the Havards. I see them because they stayed in, in the house. You know, your, your grandpa got saved right after uh, I started church years ago. And stayed, he told me he hadn't been in church in 50 years. Now, I don't know how old Papa was when he died, but he's old, real old. He always wore the same jacket. He had two jackets, one for the summer and one for the winter, brown one for the summer. Y'all remember Sister Haver? And, and his Sister Haver, the sweetest thing ever walked on earth. Amen. And they sit over here. But I think about them. They got their reward. They stayed faithful. They didn't cast away their confidence. And we go through life and little things begin to take. And that's what ticks me off is that little things begin to take us out. Amen. I'm telling you, just like Paul told the Hebrews uh, here, do not cast away your confidence. It has a reward with it. First John 5, 14. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything again, he hears us. And if we know, if, know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have this petition that we desired of him. Confidence produces a reward. Let me close right here. Confidence. I'm confident. I know what God did in me. When I back up to 1979, 1979, that was a long time ago. I'd graduated from high school. I'd entered into college. I had a, a drinking problem. I'd already started messing with drugs. I had no future. And when God saved me, when the light came on, I remember it like yesterday. I'm running around in my Dodge Charger. I left that church house on a Saturday night. I was bubbly. Bubbly. I didn't know you guys could get bubbly. But I was bubbly. I was giddy. 
I was giddy with this with this newfound love that was inside me. It was there was an excitement that, and I was by myself, and and I'm driving along, and and I'm thinking to myself, Jerry, you you did something tonight. You've never done. You slipped into churches when you was a little boy. You walked to altars and shook hands with preachers, but you had no excitement about it. It was just a, it was just to make your friends happy. But this is about you. And tonight, you accepted Christ as your Savior. And as giddy as I was, I was hotboxing that Viceroy cigarette as fast as I could. And I lit off another one right off of it. Man, I was, because there was a dog fight going on inside me, man. I mean, I was thinking, could it be true that he would love me with all the stuff that I've done? The meanness and wickedness? I was listening to Nazareth. I, these are those things you don't forget. I was listening to Nazareth, Hair of the Dog. Amen. Eight track. In my radio, radio Shack realistic eight track under dash. You didn't get them in the dash. So that day you had under the dash in that 72 charge. And I remember when I reached over and I pulled that eight track out and I threw them cigarettes out the window. And I said, God, if I really believe something happened to me tonight. I'm going to... I'm, I'm going to step into this. And I didn't decide I'm going to step into this for 43 years. I decided I'm going to step into this tomorrow. And then, then the next day, I'm going to step into the next day. And then my friends came over on a Sunday evening. They had a 12-pack of beer, and they had me a date for that night. I said, no, nah, guys, I can't go with you. I'm going to church tonight. They said, church tonight? Sunday night? You don't go to church on Sunday night. We always in church this morning. <laughs> No, I'm going tonight. So I stepped in it again. And I just kept stepping. For 43 years, I didn't decide. I haven't decided I'm going to make 60. I just decided I'm going to make it tomorrow. I'm just going to go one more day. And every day he meets me. And each day you get more confidence in what God can do. It says, now the just shall live by faith. When I don't feel it, when the church house ain't packed, when there's no finances in the, in the bank for you, amen, when things ain't going well, I'm going to live by faith. I'm going to live by faith when the bank, when all, I got lots of money in the bank, when the church house is full, when the worship's great, amen, I'm going to live by faith. In other words, whatever's happening, I'm going to keep living by faith. But if any man draw back, gets the sulks, shrinks, my soul shall not be pleased with him. I ain't got no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. The just. Who's the just? The justified. The redeemed. The children of the king. They're not going to shrink. They're not going to cower. Don't throw away your confidence. If I, could, if I could squeeze that whole verse, Hebrews 10, 35, don't discard, dispel, dis, dismiss, dump, cast off your bold declaration of faith because it has great recompense and reward. God's going to reward us. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I'm urging. I'm begging. I'm pleading. Don't let Satan talk you into tossing away your faith. Don't let friends talk you into tossing away your faith. Don't let life talk you into tossing away your faith. You've waited too long. You've invested too much of your life into the promise of God. You walk for Him. Now don't walk away. If you walk away from what God promised you after waiting all these years, it will mean that all those years were in vain. They were for nothing. Pastor, is God going to turn my mourning into rejoicing? Don't throw it away. Is He really going to turn our ashes into beauty? Don't throw it away. How much longer do we have to wait for the promise of God to come to pass? I'm telling you, don't throw it away. Did we misunderstand the promises of God? Did I read it wrong? Is it coming into the English right out of the Greek and the Hebrew? Don't throw it away. Are we waiting for something that's never going to happen? Don't throw it away. Father, in the name of Jesus, concrete it. Settle it. Put it in our spirit. That tomorrow I'm going to walk for God. The next day I'm going to walk for God. Lord, I'm not going to throw away my confidence in you. 
I'm believing you for my children, my children's children, and the sphere of influence I have around me. I have confidence in Jesus' name. Everybody say, in Jesus' name. Come on, if you believe his preacher, say, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Come on, give God a praise in this house. Yes! Those watching online, even though some of you are unable to make it to church, let me tell you, don't cast away your confidence in God. Stick with Him in your believing, in your faith, in your friends, amen, in your fellowship. Uh, don't, don't stay out there all by yourself. Make sure you connect with people. You say, Pastor, I don't have a church where I'm at. Find people to hang out with. Amen. Connect with some people there. Amen. Maybe a Bible study or something until you find the house. Until then, we appreciate you watching us online. Amen. If you need to tie the offering envelope, it's in front of you. Amen. Those that are watching, you can go to holywild.net slash give. Thank you, sir. Sean, thanks for coming today. Appreciate you showing up. Amen. I have our servant leaders to come up. It's hard to believe we're in November. Not only are we in November, we're in the middle of November. We're moving through November. Amen. I, I'm excited about what we consider here in America Thanksgiving. Amen. To be thankful for the good things of God. And to remind yourself, remind yourself, it's not wrong with you to even post what you're thankful for. Amen. And appreciative for. I, I, I'm just, I'm thankful to get to do what we do. I'm learning to be thankful for these blue pews. Just learn to be thankful. Amen. If uh, you have opportunity and you've not been baptized, please uh, call the office, let us know. This would be the place to get baptized. I walked into the church over in New Caney this morning, dropped something off, and, and I was thinking about doing baptisms today. It was 30 degrees. And I thought, man, you won't get dunked. This is the place to get dunked. You indoors here. Amen. Out there, you in the swimming pool or in a horse trough. Hallelujah. Be praying for the North Campus. I always encourage them to pray for you, and I always let them know that you, t you think of them. Amen. To remember to connect, to stay connected with one another. Please do this. There are people out there that are this close to losing their confidence. Call them this week. Amen. Encourage them. You know, I'm, I'm a sports fan. You know that. But I, I don't put my confidence in all the sports that I see. I, I thank God for that. Our, it's, that's entertainment. But some people get so discouraged, amen, that they, get, they, get, they beat themselves up. Uh, don't buy into condemnation. You know, condemnation, when God saves you, and you know you're saved and you love God, and you hear something that tells you, you you're not going to go to heaven, that's condemnation. That's a devil talking, amen. Don't listen to that, amen. Stand strong in your faith in Jesus' name. As we give today, we believe in God for Jobs and better jobs. More money, less hours. Benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor and success to the kingdom of God. Amen, Pastor David.